We are just two weeks away from the critically important midterm elections, and I've been talking to strategists and pollsters from both parties today to try to get a sense and share with you what they think the lay of the land is right now. So allow me to be your guide, if you will, as we take a look at what they think is actually going on out there. Because earlier this month, you might remember, we told you about how President Biden's pollster had coined this election, head wins versus head cases. The head wins, in his view, challenging the Democrats, majority disapproval of President Biden, high inflation, a possible recession, among other factors. The head cases, hindering Republicans, what Republican Senate leader Mitch McConnell diplomatically referred to as candidate quality issues. That's Republican candidates with limited appeal or various scandals, creating challenges in races that theoretically they should be running away with. But those headwinds, they seem to be a changing and getting a little stronger. And the politicos with whom I spoke today all agree, as of now, a modest red wave at the very least seems to be building. Best estimates put Republicans in, at picking up about 25 seats. They only need to win five to flip the House for Congressman Kevin McCarthy to become House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. How worried are Democrats? Well, just today, President Biden directed the Democratic National Committee to transfer another $18 million to help House and Senate Democrats in their races. That includes a very high-profile race in New York featuring the head of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, a member of House Democratic leadership. The DCCC is apparently so worried about its own chairman, Congressman Sean Patrick Maloney, that the DCCC is throwing another $600,000 into the race to defend him. That alone for Democrats is alarming. But when Democrats are concerned about House seats in New England, that is a flashing red light. First Lady Jill Biden heads to Rhode Island tomorrow to help a Democratic House candidate there. Vice President Kamala Harris visited Connecticut earlier this month to help a House Democratic candidate there. And Republicans are reportedly now recommitting money in New Hampshire to try to unseat Democratic Senator Maggie Hassan. Continuing our trip now through the political landscape, let's go visit my home Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Tonight, the two Senate candidates in that race sparred in their first and only debate, Democratic Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman versus Republican candidate Mehmet Oz. I'm also having to talk about something called the Oz rule, that if he's on TV, he's lying. John Fetterman takes everything to an extreme, and those extreme positions hurt us all. Now, this race looked like a slam dunk victory for Fetterman earlier this summer, and not just because it's 6'8", he towers over Dr. Oz. People have been trying to label me my entire life. I do not look like a typical politician. I don't even look like a typical person. Since then, the polls have tightened. They seem to be basically within the margin of error right now. And while Oz has been out-memed on social media by Fetterman, who paints the longtime New Jersey resident as a, as a phony and a quack, Fetterman has been hit with millions of dollars in campaign ads attacking him on TV for being soft on crime. John Fetterman's record on crime is crazy. John Fetterman supports decriminalizing dangerous drugs like fentanyl and heroin. Fetterman's ideas are radical, deadly, and wrong. And for Pennsylvanians and those in the tri-state area, you will likely soon see more TV ads just like those because today the top Republican Super PAC announced they're going to throw another $6 million into the race. And now it's possible that Dr. Oz could, could become Senator Oz, even though Oz has a net negative favorability rating in Pennsylvania. More people disapprove of him there than approve of him. Quite a big gap at that. Let's turn west now. Let's go from Pennsylvania to America's Dairyland and another Senate race in which momentum has seemed to shift toward the GOP in recent weeks. With, again, Republicans attacking the Democratic lieutenant governor, in this case, Mandela Barnes, for being soft on crime. You know, a Washington Post analysis out today found that Republicans have spent tens of millions of dollars more attacking Democrats on crime than on inflation. Now, just two months ago, Democrats were confident that Barnes would be able to knock off Wisconsin Senator Ron Johnson. Now, the race is a toss-up. People I spoke to today think that Ron Johnson probably even has a slight edge. 
and the Democratic finger-pointing has begun. The National Party has totally failed us, and so it's going to come down to Wisconsin Democrats. People are just hitting their heads against the wall. How did we, how did we let this happen? Over a thousand miles away, let's go to Arizona. Republican heavyweights are trying to boost Blake Masters, the Republican nominee against incumbent Democratic Senator Mark Kelly. Kelly, it is believed, may, may have a slight edge, but that race, too, is tightening. In the last two weeks, former Vice President Mike Pence and Senator Rick Scott of Florida, the head of the Republican Senate arm, have flown in to campaign with Masters. The next leg of our midterms journey is to navigate the roadblocks that stand between Democrats and electoral success. What has happened in the last two months that has changed this race? Well, I think uh, inflation. I mean, everybody's feeling it in their pocketbook. That is the number one concern for Americans right now. And yet a new poll from Monmouth says 63% of Americans believe that President Biden is not paying enough attention to the issues that matter most to them. And that may be part of the reason why Democrats also are starting to face some structural problems with various racial minorities, groups that they've been able to rely upon for electoral support in the past. Blacks, Latinos, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, groups that are starting slowly but surely to peel away from automatically supporting Democrats. One poll shows that Hispanic support for Democrats in congressional races has dropped by about 13 points since the 2016 and 2018 elections. Now, 13 points that might not sound like much to you, but even if just a sliver of minority voters cast a ballot for Republicans or stay at home, that could be in these tight races enough to hand the Republicans a victory. And voter enthusiasm for Democrats among Democratic groups and demographics, right now that appears a real challenge, as Senator Bernie Sanders told me two days ago. I am worried about the level of uh, voter turnout among young people and working people who will be voting Democratic. I think what we have got to do is contrast what a strong pro-worker Democratic position is with the corporate agenda of the Republicans. So the headwinds are discouraging those voters from voting Democratic. And among key swing voters, Democrats who control the White House and the House and the Senate, they're being held responsible for the state of the nation. And Democrats have everything, everything to lose. So here is where on our midterms tour, you would expect we would bump into the face of the party, President Joe Biden. No one would fault you for assuming that Biden is right now out there blitzing the country, rallying in every single battleground state, along with Bruce Springsteen and Bon Jovi and Jay-Z, trying to protect his majority. The reality is he's not. Not even in Pennsylvania, where the famous son of Scranton has roots. As of now, Democratic candidates in Pennsylvania do not seem to want him there, which makes it all the more challenging for Biden and his party to buck historical trends. Because history shows that the party in power tends to lose seats in the midterm elections. For George W. Bush in 2006, he took a thumping. Look, this is a close election. The if you look at race by race, it was close. The cumulative effect, however, was not too close. It was a thumping. For Barack Obama in 2010, despite star-studded rallies, he took a shellacking. I'm not recommending for every future president that they take a shellacking like, they, like I did last night. A thumping, a shellacking. I'm not sure what gerund Joe Biden might trot out in two weeks. A stomping, perhaps. But if Biden acknowledges a walloping, it's not as if it would be unprecedented. Now, the past might not be prologue, however, when it comes to something else. And as your election guide, I've got to warn you, boys and girls, watch your step. We're entering unchartered territory. This will be the very first election since Donald Trump convinced a huge swath of the American public that the U.S. election system is rigged. It's a false charge, but it led to a bloody insurrection. And this time around, we're seeing big signs of potential trouble. Candidates in key races across the country continue to lie to voters about the 2020 election. These are, in some cases, the very same people who will be in charge of certifying the election results if they win. The list includes Secretary of State candidates in Nevada and Arizona, plus Arizona's Republican candidate for governor, Carrie Lake. That 
could become a huge problem in 2024 if those folks get elected and if they continue to swear allegiance to Trump's lies instead of the U.S. Constitution. Another issue now, not in 2024, but now, these allegations of voter intimidation we're hearing. Intimidation by vigilantes. Some of them are now under investigation. Last Friday, two armed individuals dressed in tactical gear were spotted at a ballot drop box in Mesa, Arizona. Also in the Grand Canyon State, a group calling itself Clean Elections USA, accused of stalking ballot boxes, taking photos of voters' license plates. This is impacting mostly, we're told, Latino voters and, in particular, the elderly. Seniors often prefer a ballot drop-off to having to stand in long lines, according to a lawsuit filed on behalf of those voters. And yet, Clean Elections USA has allegedly accused at least one voter, perhaps your average grandma, of being a mule. A mule is a reference to a fringe voter fraud conspiracy that was amplified in the latest MAGA propaganda film, the widely discredited, fact-challenged 2,000 Mules. Now we come to the most important question of all. Was the magnitude of vote trafficking enough to tip the balance in the 2020 presidential election? It's not a leap to say this would have made a difference. It's not a leap. It's just a lie. It's just a huge lie. How full of crap is it? Well, they had to pull the 2,000 Mules book before it even went on sale. They had to edit it. They had to rewrite it, presumably to avoid legal action, according to NPR today. In the 2020 election and in the 2022 midterms, there is no credible evidence of mules. There is credible evidence of jackasses. Now, this is just what the terrain looks like right now, and it is hard to know what it all might mean. The U.S. is also currently seeing record numbers for early voting. More than 9 million Americans have already cast their ballots. Is that good for Democrats? Is it good for Republicans? One thing we can assert is it's good for democracy. It's good for the republic. There is something motivating Americans to drop what they're doing, stand in line, and participate in a midterm election. Regardless of what experts are predicting right now, whether they're relying on polling or turnout data, inflation, whether they're reading animal entrails. As always, you, the American people, you get the final say. 